with that, I mean, then back to you guys. What high performing schools look like, and some of them can have 15 characteristics, and some of them have had six characteristics. And uh, they landed on nine characteristics that they saw again and again and again. And some of them uh, will resonate more with, with you than others. This is not brain surgery. And a lot of people go, well, that's little one. Of course, that would be that would be something you'd want to see happen at the school. But it's it's a matter of being really intentional about those practices that we know are best practices and that do work. So what this is for you is to just sort of lay out a picture of what a high-performing school is going to look like in a lot of cases. And it takes in everybody. So the research didn't find any silver bullet that every school needed to have. The only silver bullet, truly, is good instruction. That's when the rubber you know, hits the road. There could be a lot of things failing around, but if there's good instruction in that classroom, that would be the only silver bullet. So the first, first characteristic of high-performing schools is called clear shared focus. Do you have a mission statement here? Do we have a mission statement? So can you tell me what the mission statement is? What is it? The mission of Elmira High School is to uh, effective learning, to, go, to meet the state standards through active teaching and learning, and to better prepare students socially and academically to be better global citizens. I might have missed a couple That's of very good. Let the kids think for a while, let them struggle a little bit, 
and then call on somebody. And they call everyone. And then the other thing is um, we need to make sure that we're reaching out to families and helping families because one of the things we're very good at as middle class people is we're really good at um, handling institutions and working through systems. We've learned to do this for years and years. And a lot of our parents don't know how to do that. And sometimes we're the only person that they have kind of, that could do that. And so to always be thinking about, is this a family that could use my help a little bit, getting started with maybe some of the systems that they have? Just to be thinking about that, because systems are one of the most difficult part for people in poverty. They don't know the system, they don't know how to access the system, and they don't know how to work the system. So any help we can give when we have 15 to 60 percent poverty here, that means five to six out of ten of our kids, they need that help. Does that make sense? All right, so the next one is uh, effective school leadership. And when we first started doing that work in Washington, and they were training us, I said, what do we do when we're going to a school and they've got a crummy thing? I didn't have an answer to that because politically they didn't want to go there. Um, it's very difficult to overcome an ineffective principle in a school. Um, you can do it in, in spots and you can do it in pockets, but it's very, very difficult. The best scenario is to have effective school leadership that includes teachers. So we're talking principal, teachers, EAs, everybody coming together to lead that school. That's the most effective way. And so, once again, that shared leadership model, that servant model, that's what service students the best. So leadership depends upon relationships and shared values between leaders and others. Shared values. So does it help if, as a teacher, I believe all students can learn, and as a principal, they believe some students can learn? That doesn't help, does it? So what we want is for all of us to be on the same page and share these values about all students. We should believe in continuous improvement, and that's improvement of the principal, and that's improvement of everybody in the building, everybody in the building. Um, principals, now more than ever, need to be instructional leaders. Um, Fifteen years ago, they could be managers and do just fine. Uh, not in today's world. We need instructional leadership in each and every school. So the teacher or the principal needs to be able to uh, teach their way out of the paper bag. We need to be able to do that. And more and more of them can now. Um, we need to have needs-based allocation of resources. So we need to look at our budget here in, in, in Fern Ridge and see if all the schools, when we look at the needs of the schools, is there one school where the students are a little more at risk or a, struggling more, and do we need to allocate a few more resources there? Yes, that's how we should be looking at our budget, that's what we should be doing. That's what effective schools are doing. So, you know, when we start this battle over dollars, which invariably happens, we always want to think that they're all, all of our kids. It's not my kids here and your kids there. They're all, all of our kids. And so if we change that mindset so that folks, those kids over here, they're going to be a little more, that's what my kids do, yeah. I have a problem with that. So we need people, and this means teachers and principals that lead by example, that focus on students and learning, that support and empower colleagues. I mean, that looks a lot different than not supporting and not empowering, does it? So supporting and empowering. And I, I think that's one of the biggest jobs I'm going to have here, is supporting and empowering. Not being up here playing queen. That's not even anybody any good at all. And not say, hey, I know all this stuff. That's not going to do anybody any good at all. What I need to do is empower you. Empower you to get the help you need to do whatever it is you want, you need to do. So that's what I look at myself. That's the kind of leadership I want to get. Recognizing and rewarding the achievements of others. That's so important. We all want to hear it now and then, and we're not doing that bad a job, right? So, you know, I hope we can all start recognizing each other and ourselves. And I certainly hope our leadership is recognizing and letting people know you're a bad boy. That's good, because we're human beings and we all need to hear we're pretty good, okay? That's a nice thing to hear. So, uh, good leaders invite participation. 
and they share responsibility, and they create safe environments. And I mean, adults need to be safe. Adults in the school need to feel safe. So that if you're taking a risk with students, and you trip and fall, and that lesson blew up in this what was I thinking? That you have somebody next to you that hands over it. That's okay. Let's, let's figure it out together. That's what we need. We need somebody to feel safe, not always looking over the shoulder like, are they going to catch me? Screw it up. You should be able to screw up and still be supportive and work through it so you don't make the same screw up twice. I screwed up so many things in my lifetime. But rarely have I done it twice. You know, it's kind of like, okay, I don't want to do that one, I guess. But I did it the first time. And so I'm here to tell you that, you know, let's take risks and let's do what we can for students and, and let's help each other through. This time was so funny when people started talking about collaboration. That was one of those words I thought was kind of stupid to be honest with you. But um, when this first came about, you know, people were kind of, kind of like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? And when people finally started having some release time to work together and have like an early release or late start or curriculum days or whatever they were, they started to, if they were well planned, and if they were utilized correctly, people started seeing huge, I mean, the impact that they have on their teaching, and on their relationships, and on just the job they got done, because they have time, we need time to reflect, and we're going so fast, when do we have time to stop and reflect? Like, I can guarantee you I will be reflecting all night and continuously for the next month about what I'm doing here today. And I'll be just like, <laughs> and that's what we're supposed to do. Like, we need to reflect on our practice all the time because that's the only way to get better. But if I just gave this and then never thought about it again, I wouldn't be very good the next time. I need to try to change it up and be better. So once again, that continuous thing. Okay, the definition of this collaboration <laughs> thing Thank you. 
give them an understanding of what it's going to look like, whether it's a college or coming up. Um, so the more we can do to let them know what the tests are going to look like, the better shot they'll be able to have to show them the learning they really have. Otherwise, all they're doing is failing and taking the test. It doesn't have much to do with what the learning was. We want to put resources toward collaboration. We've done that in the middle and high school. Costs money, it doesn't. It costs money to do that, but it's money well spent. We need safe atmospheres for sharing and collaborating. We need a mechanic mechanisms in place. You know, adults have tension. Adults that work together can encounter tensions. And so we need to make sure that the principals and the teachers in our schools have a way to work out these tensions that don't happen to blow up. It's really coming upon ourselves to be professional at all times, but you can still have some tensions here. And this seems like just so one-on-one, -on -one, but when they found these studies, they're doing the studies where everybody says they've aligned their curriculum, they've aligned their curriculum, they've aligned their curriculum, State standards, and then a lot of times people go ahead and close their door and they teach what they want to teach. It doesn't have much to do with the aligned curriculum. So we really need to make sure that when we've gone through all this work to align the curriculum, that we really teach what we align. Otherwise, it's just kind of a mistake. Um, I don't think that happens as much as it used to, but it is something really where people have a really hard time with this in curriculum, but it's a lot harder than what they thought they did. And so it's real hard to move forward. And a lot of the reason for that was because they weren't given enough staff development to come up with the new curriculum. So it's like one of those single little things. Um, curriculum always needs to be research based, and we need to have it process based rather than skills based. So we want to treat, we want to teach students the process of getting to the piece. Like they have skills to start with, but then they can learn how to do the process. And the smart balance is all about that process. All about that process. Um, I remember it says here, leave between assessment and instruction. And I remember when my son was about seventh or eighth grade, and he said, I don't want to have this in school, so I don't want to have this in school, so of course I need to be able to go to, okay, who's the teacher? Teachers are the teachers, she must be a little hard, what's going on? Right now? And I said, oh, really, why? And, you know, he said, because she's one of those people, you know, she teaches stuff, and then you take the test, and it's on stuff you've never seen before. It just seems like teachers to teach you what they're going to test you on. Okay, I was at the seventh graders now. It seems like we'd all be doing that, but you'd be surprised at how many of our teachers just kind of lose, lose where they are in the curriculum, and they do. They go through great lessons and all those things, and then they get an assessment, and they didn't have a whole lot to do with the lessons. So it seems one-on-one, but in our practice, we still have people doing that. Um, students being directly involved in their assessment helps their assessment, helps them understand what's going on. So if you have them maybe help them design an assessment or you help each other, uh, it can make the student much more involved in understanding and learning what's on that assessment. It makes it much more powerful. I'm sure you've all done curriculum mapping, right? Isn't that fun? We love curriculum mapping. But it's really important. It's an important thing to do. So we know we've got that goalpost, our safety is a goalpost. This is what the kids supposed to know. And so then you can look along the way and make sure you are getting all the pieces to get to that goal place. I think it's helpful having the goal place. I think it helps us to know where we're supposed to go. and the 
to make sure we do it. We just teach right to them. The whole school needs to teach to the standards, not just some teachers, not just some pockets, not just some departments. The whole school needs to teach to the standards. We need to analyze student learning and adjust accordingly. And teaching to rubrics is 90% good. It's 100% good if you have good rubrics. So you need to analyze your rubrics. But that's a really good thing, to show students what an exemplar work looks like. So they have a roadmap then. It really helps. Just like if I'm telling you today my expectations and you, that helps, doesn't it? Then what does she want? No, 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 you know? The teacher's very clear with the students on what they, what they want, what it looks like. They'll be much more likely to produce it. So that's called having the criteria for success posted and taught. So if you get an assignment, if you have a project they're supposed to do, the criteria for the success of that project should be laid out, posted, and referred to often. Your project will contain these things. And if you did it a secret, then how can they be successful? So we have to be really overt about all of this. Monitoring of good and not so good teaching. So our principals have a tough position because they're friends with most of you and like you on a deep level. And so if you're not you know, doing your very best work in the classroom, it's up to them to help you get over the hump. But those are courageous conversations that are difficult to have. But I expect our principals to have those conversations. And I expect you to have part of those conversations. And together you get over the hump. It's not just the principal pointing at you and saying, I don't like that, change it up. That doesn't do anybody any good. It's so much nicer, isn't it, to have somebody to collaborate with and say, yeah, you know, can you give me some ideas? Can we work through this together? That's what you want to have. We're all in it together. We're all in the soup together. I can't stress that enough. So we're going to improve. We're going to improve together as well. If you don't help me improve, I'm not going to be any better at the end of next year than I am at the end of this year. I'll look this exact same. I don't want to look the same. I don't want to look like this. I want to look like that. I want to keep getting better and better. With your help, I will. With your, you know, teaching and coaching me, then I'll be a better superintendent a year from now than I am now. And I expect you that continuous learning thing. That's what we should all be striving for. Um, if we're really doing our job, not one single student falls through the cracks. Think about that. Not one single student falls through the cracks. We need to have, in the elementary level, 90 minutes of math instruction and 90 minutes of reading instruction. And so I don't know what your schedules have looked like in the past, but this is what we're up against today. We need 90 minutes of math, 90 minutes of reading. Instruction, the elementary level. If we're getting new students in, we need to look at, we need to look at their folders. We need to look at their files. We need to study where they are. So when they hit our classroom, we have an idea of what the student needs. So don't just hit a student goal. Make sure that you do some research on every new student that's coming in. And I know, like, for example, Karen's already doing that. We're getting special education folders in and files in from students. And she's going through and looking. That's what we all should be doing. It's good practice. Classroom assessments are key. Now, what we all concentrate on, of course, are our state tests. And now we're worried about the smarter balance tests. And we should be. But remember that good classroom assessments is the key. I taught assessment classes for WSU. And I said to those kids all the time, you assess every single second of every day. You're constantly assessing. Good teachers are constantly, constantly assessing. So, um, do you guys do any looping here? You know what looping is? Looping is where, um, it's mostly at the elementary level, but you can do it at the middle school level as well. It's where you're with third grade this year, and then you stay with that same grade, go up to fourth grade with them. Um, that's a really good thing to use with, with students from poverty because it takes students from poverty a lot longer to form a relationship of trust than it does students from middle class or from intact homes that don't have some of the chaos. So looping is something that I always recommend. Small class size, of course, is optimum. They say uh, up to 15. And then after that, pretty much it doesn't matter. 
So if you can get small class size 15 and below, you got yourself a you know, class size that's going to matter. After that, between 15, 15 and 30, there's not that much difference if you can really do research. So I think small class sizes have kind of gone by the wayside. Wait time after questions. That wait time is so hard for us. Uh, we've been taught not to wait. And so making yourself wait and letting the students struggle. Letting students struggle is really an important thing. Our culture doesn't try to allow our students to struggle or anybody to struggle. We become very uncomfortable with struggle. But actually, students that struggle and struggle overtly, um, they'll be more likely to get over the humps. Uh, feedback needs to be immediate and ongoing. We need to have classroom management. I think I mentioned that before. Let me mention it again. We need to have good classroom management. And if you don't feel you have good classroom management, please have your principal help you with that. Principal, if you have somebody with classroom management issues, please help them with that because those students in there are learning. We need to maximize learning time. I spoke to this a little bit before too, but we've actually done all kinds of research around transitions. And transitions that are quick and taught and kids know how to do it and they go from one task to the other, you can gain as much as an hour of instruction time by having really good transitions. So it's a really important piece to teach at the beginning of the year. Teach those, those uh, strategies and all those routines and then your, your transition time is so quick and so don't lose the instruction time. The kids are still ready to learn. So it's a great thing. We always want to teach those routines. I just mentioned that as well. Please vary the classroom sitting seating. Don't always have the same students sitting in the front. Change them up because it'll change up their learning style a little bit. It really helps them if you move them around the classroom. Now, if you have somebody you can't see, of course, you have to keep them up front. If you have a kid, you have to throttle all the time, you know, keep them up front. But really, if you vary, if you vary it, don't have the kids sit in the same spot all year. It helps them, it helps their brain, it helps them grow dendrites. Um, we want to make sure the principal's in the classroom helping what's happening. We want to have the time for reflection and review. And we want to have a lot of walkthroughs. And that doesn't just mean teachers. We want to be able to wander through somebody else's classroom as well. So if you're, if you're on a break and you have your prep time and somebody else is teaching, while you're in there and watch, you might learn something. So walk through each other's classroom. Have, let's have a culture where we, we're fine dropping in on each other and talking about when you're really doing a good when we're really having a good culture, it's when I can go flop down in your classroom and say, you know what, I saw you doing this in your class today, and I, I can't do that. I I'm just, I can't do that. Will you help me do that? That's when you know you have a safe culture. Where somebody can say, I'm failing at that, but you're not, can you help me with that? And that's what we want. Because none of us are good at everything we like to think we are, but we're not. I, I'll use me as an example. I'm bad at really a lot of things. None of us are good at everything. So those are the things that are important. Uh, the research shows that if we do those kinds of things in our classroom, we will more than likely have successful students. And I cannot stress enough looking at the data. So it's not like we just feel they're doing well. We can prove they're doing well. So our whole RTI thing, I mean, it needs to have groups where kids go in and out. It's fluid as a student you know, goes up and kind of starts reaching the level we want them at. They don't have to stay in those rooms. So all that takes a system. All that takes a system. And, and I'm in charge of the system. So at this point, if the system isn't working for students, then we'll need to change it up and make a system that does work for students and for staff. So for years and years, we had what we call slumming lane drive-by staff development, where people hear about something, and they say, oh, can I go to this conference? And then they spend a bunch of money, go to the conference, and come back, and then we would have a clue what it was, and nobody got taught, and we just kept it with ourselves. That was kind of how staff development went for a long time. So as we improved what we know about the research and what we know, we know we have to have very focused staff development around certain issues. So we're going to have focused staff development this year around a few issues. One is going to be objectives. We're going to be talking about objectives a lot and how we have objectives for students and how we make sure we post objectives. So, you know, I think a lot of times we have an objective in our mind. The student may have no idea, why are we doing this? What is this for? And if we can help them see that little mark, then we'll help them. It, makes, it helps them know where they're going. So that's one of the things we'll be talking about. We are going to have an awful lot of discussion around instruction. Like I said, that's where the rubber meets the road, and I can 
consider myself to be an instructional leader, and um, I think that's you know a good thing for districts right now because we're up against it. And so if we're all concentrated on instruction and helping each other be those best instructors because I know we've got excellent instructors in here, excellent. So if we can use a trainer trainer model and help each other, um, we'll all be able to rise. So, this emphasis on meaningful and ongoing professional development is aligned with the vision and purpose. Uh-oh, there you go, now things are starting to intertwine. Vision and purpose, staff development, you know, why are we here? What kind of help do we need to get where we want to go? It's evaluated in relation to the impact on student learning, not participant satisfaction. Wow, that is something for me. So we need to do these assessments because what we, excuse me, what I would hope that you want to learn about, hopefully it would be the same thing you want to learn about, but maybe you have an area where you really need help. So we're going to have to have needs assessments ongoing to make sure that we're meeting the needs of everybody. So we partly stuff that I really want you to get and partly stuff that you really need to get. It goes both ways. So we need intensive, intensive mentoring. We need teacher inquiry or study groups. We need collaborative lesson study and we need to look at student work. The, it should be job embedded, so it should be ongoing and come to you at times and go out at times. It shouldn't be the thing where you go, like I talked about before, you go to some great seminar and then you come back and nobody has anything to do about it. Um, best practices are taught and discussed and honored. So we, we have done research now, we know what the best practices are. And I will be on, we'll be having conversations with you as you will be having with each other. And we'll land on these best practices and that is all that we'll be allowed. We won't be allowed, you know, there's no time to do things that, that haven't been proven to work. We've got so much research on what works for students. That's what we should be doing. And so if we need more work around what works, that's okay. So what if we don't all know what works the best? That's what we're here for. We'll help figure out what works the best, and that's the things we'll do. Um, mentoring each other and peer support is so important. I mentioned a little bit before, but the research shows that in those schools where that's going on, everybody's better. So reaching out to each other, like we talked about. Um, the study of student work and, and trading student work with each other, you might find if you trade with, with another teacher that what you expect is way lower than what the other teacher expects. Okay, well, let's calibrate this. Is this teacher expecting too much or am I expecting too little? So do a calibrating and training of student work so we all know what we're expecting of these students. So the next one is supportive learning environment and, and this is actually um, a very important one to me because it takes into account uh, the differences in kids and the um, fact that we need to be teaching, treating our students equitably and being culturally sound with them. So a supportive learning environment. The reason we want to have a supportive learning environment is to increase the resiliency of our students. And if they're resilient, they'll be able to bounce back from anything that happens to them. And so our job when they come in those doors is to increase their resiliency. Because sometimes some of them will come to us with very little resiliency because they've already lived such chaotic lives that they don't know what resilience is. So it needs to be safe in our hallways our lunchroom, our playground, our bus, and our classroom. And it's not going to be safe in our hallways in high school. It's not going to be safe in our hallways because teachers and aides are not out in the hall helping on Gary and Brian can't do it by themselves. So if we're going to have bullying going on, those are the problems we're just going to be around. So it's really important that we all do our job of helping have a supportive learning environment by making sure we're supporting good student behavior. And we do that sometimes by just standing there, just being present. But you know, I know we're all busy in our rooms getting ready for the next, for the next thing. But if we could even just stand in the doorway and be able to keep an eye on our classroom and clap an eye on the hall. You know, I mean, there's just small little things that can really make a difference in our environment. Um, students who are being watched are less likely to fall, are less likely to use bad language, are less likely to do those stupid things that kids find themselves just dying to do. If there are eyes upon them, they do them less. They're pure and simple. So we need to be really alert and really aware. 
Um, I've seen so many staff members walk by here, hear the F word, and just keep walking. And we can't do that. We can't allow that because it just grows upon itself. It's kind of like the graffiti thing. We all hate all the graffiti and say, well, we want graffiti everywhere. So when you hear poor language, you need to stop it. It's just not right. And so it's a hassle, but it's a lot easier to keep walking and go get my cup of coffee. But if we're doing our job, we'll stop. And I mean, I used to notice my students every year, in this classroom, you will not bully and you will not be bullied. You're safe in this classroom. And guess who's the most relieved? The bullies who have to keep up the act. Then they don't have to even start it. And so, you know, if you announce this is a bully three years old, I'm going to be watching. We need to treat each other with respect and dignity. They will. If we make it difficult to bully, they're not going to do it as much. I mean, I think it's really a sad thing that we had to pass a law that said that we had to not allow bullying in our classroom. I mean, come on, you guys. We're, the, we're in charge here. And they had to pass a law to tell us not to allow them to bully. So, you know, we just need to step up to the plate and not allow bullying. No significant learning occurs without a significant relationship. So what exercise I often use with schools is to put every student's name up, put every student's name up, and I give the staff a little circle of thoughts, and the staff that has a relationship with the student puts a, a dot next to their name. And then when you get all done, you look and see, are the kids' names with no dots? And invariably there are. And so a school that's really concerned about that significant relationship piece will do that exercise and then go back and divvy up those kids and make sure there's a staff member that is routinely checking in with that student and trying to develop a relationship. That's how we'll lose fewer kids. That's how we'll keep more kids in the school. Those significant relationships. If somebody, if somebody cares about them here, I'm much more likely to turn on. So being very overt about caring. We can't, uh, I mean, we're all in this game because we care. So just be very overt about caring. Let them know you care. Even if they act like they don't care, they do. You know that. We need to make it safe for all of our children. And I, I will always say to the staffs when I'm talking to them, you'll know if you have a safe culture in your school, if you're gay and perceived to be gay, gay or trans, gender children are safe. If they're safe to be who they are, and if they're not holy, and if they're treated respectfully by each and every staff member, not just some staff members, then you probably have yourself a safe culture, because that's the toughest one. They, they get the most hostility directed at them. They get the most threats, they get the most uh, bullied. Second is Native American children. All students are greeted. All students are greeted each and every day by everybody. And so every child that enters your classroom, you should greet them by name. They need to be kind. So glad you're here, how you doing? How was last night? How'd you do on your homework? And it's just so quick. But every student needs to be created. We want to have a stimulating learning environment. And by that I mean student work up on the walls. Um, very important to have student work showing on the walls. Student work. And it makes them look proud, it makes them know what's the centerpiece. You know, um, I don't care about mood lighting in your classroom or you know, real cool posters, but I do care about seeing student work. I don't know what your students are working on in your classroom. I want to see it evident so that if a parent steps into your classroom like that, they're going to know what you're doing, what you're teaching, what their, their kids are learning. So student work is what it's all about. So that's what we should be focused on and center. Um, how do you create small learning environments? You know, if you have those little groups here, little groups there, and then you help facilitate those groups. That helps the poor kids that haven't learned a lot of good communication skills. It really helps them. And, you know, they come to us with all these things in their life. And if we can help them process the adversity, if we have a significant relationship with them, and we can help them somehow process the adversity in their lives, 
you're better off for it, and you'll be more resilient. We want safe and orderly classrooms with high expectations. We want the quick transitions, and we want to stop distractions immediately. Who we want to be is warm demanders. I'm warmly going to demand that you do your best, and I know you can get there, and I'm not going to get up on you. And that's what we do, we do all the time. That, you know, you're here to learn, I'm going to help you learn, I'll do everything within my power to make sure that you get it, because I'm not going to get up on you. And I know you can do it, pure and simple. So what kind of kids can argue with that, you know? Most of the time you can suck them in. Okay, so the last, the last characteristic is the one about parent involvement. So they talk about trying to get parents into the school. And we've already talked about how difficult that is. And I would say please do a gut check when one of those parents doesn't show up. And instead of going straight to, they just don't care. Try going to, well, you know, there might have been something that caused them not to show up besides not caring. And if that's your attitude when you talk to them again, they're going to get it. They're going to get it that you're not just blaming me for not coming, you know, that you appreciate that I've got things in my life that prevent me from, from always showing up. So that's really important. So one thing that um, research says to do, and I know it's hard, and I you know maybe it's, maybe it's impossible every year, but what they say is if you can have three risk-free get-togethers before conferences, they're much more likely to come to conferences. If you have three things, where like open house, um, or you know, a night where the barbecue back to school barbecue night, or you know, come and meet our new teachers, or come and meet our new curriculum, just anything that isn't where they have to hear how their student is doing, but they just get to come to the school and they're not put on the spot at all, and nobody's going up and saying, well, by the way, so and so didn't turn in their assignment today. If we can have three stress-free, risk-free get-togethers with the parents, they're more likely to show up for the risky ones. So it's just something to think about as we're putting together our calendar and what we do. Something to think about. Um, we need to really make special efforts to reach out to parents and let them know we want them here. And if you feed them, they will come. They're much more likely to come. Um, sending home positive notes, we mentioned this, Positive notes and phone calls. And I have to it's invite, 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 invite. Oh, I hope to see you again. Thank you so much for coming. And like we talked about before, dropping the education needs, dropping all that talk. You know, talk like you would talk to somebody who's never, you know, you go into Les Schwab, you're not talking education needs with them, are you? Talk to people that you would talk to if you knew they knew nothing about what you were talking about. It just does, it does us all good. Even our new teachers that come in and they do all these acronyms and all this, it's very hard, it's very difficult. So making sure we do that. And of course, trying to increase our cultural confidence, knowing equality versus equity, and understanding that we all have biases because we've grown up in a very biased culture. And we have learned those biases from people that we love. And so trying to know how to unlearn biases that are so ingrained we don't even know they're there. But if, if educators don't do that, I would say that we would do that. So we're going to have a focus on equity this year as well. And we'll be talking about things like this and have conversations and you know, challenging ourselves to look inside and see how deeply we may have some some belief systems that aren't conducive to helping all of our students. And then maybe we, you know, have a little bias here and there that we can work through. I know everybody's doing the best they can and nobody is on purpose trying to be biased against any student. I know that going forward. But we don't know what we don't know. I know how I'm treated. When I walk into a 7-Eleven and ask for a pop, I know I'm treated. I'm super class, educated. I'm treated better when I'm dressed up than when I'm not. But I don't know how a seven-year-old Latino boy who's not that clean gets treated when he walks into a 7-Eleven. I would say probably not the same way. So for all of us to decide that, well, things are probably okay. I mean, I'm treated pretty good. People are treated pretty good. Probably not the case for a lot of people. So we need to make sure we do gut checks all the time because we know what we know what we know, but we don't know what we don't know. And we have to always remember that. So community involvement.
all the parent involvement, you know, just show them care. Just be genuinely welcoming and inviting to them. And it just doesn't click. It just doesn't click. And make sure that you try to set a little relationship, time to decide in your interactions. It makes me feel so much better. And these are people, a lot of them are very bright and have a lot of talents and maybe haven't had the kind of environment or the kind of life where they got to utilize those talents. Or, or you know, so you just need to be careful about making judgments. I used to start talks by saying, well, you're making a couple of assumptions about them right now. You're uh, assuming I'm heterosexual. You're assuming that I'm Christian. You know, and these are what we do. We jump to these things because that's what we know. You know. So I'll just let you wonder, what is she really? <laughs> no, it's just, you know, we, we just want to gut check. That's all. So I am so, so pleased to be here. I'm so happy I got this job. And it's just amazing how many good things I've heard about Fernley School District and you guys and the kids and the staff. I mean, they really, truly have heard good things. And so somehow we've developed this pretty good reputation. And it's impressive. And I will do everything I can not to ruin your reputation.